Now that I'm in, in the role of a visiting preacher as I move into retirement, I have the problem of what to preach on. I've devoted most of my 45 years of preaching to uh, Lectio Continua preaching, that is preaching through books, uh, as indeed has been the practice here for, for decades. And when, um, when you do a one-off sermon somewhere, how do you choose a text? I did textual preaching for six months. This is 40 years ago in Northern Ireland. And I experienced Saturday night fever. Realizing at eight o'clock on a Saturday evening that this text was not gonna work. It wasn't a good text. I, I, I really didn't have a good grasp of it, of it. I wasn't confident about what to say about it. But this is the first Sunday evening of 2024. And I thought it might be appropriate to pick a text that speaks to our engagement as Christians, as believers for this coming year. Many of you, it hasn't been my practice, but many of you perhaps have entered into a resolution or two for this coming year. You tend, I think, at the end of each year to look back and reassess. And so I've chosen as my text, Philippians 2, this young man, uh, the first young man who was baptized, actually quoted it, which gave me some comfort. <laughs> Philippians 2, 12 and 13. This is a text that all of you know. I would be surprised if there was anyone in the room tonight, unless you're completely ignorant of Scripture. But if you have any grasp of the Bible at all, this is a, this is a text that you know. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, this is a text about discipleship. It's a text about Christian maturity. It's a text that addresses every single one of us who make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, that this is something that we need to do. It's almost, not quite, but it's almost a standalone text. There was a book published in the late 19th century I believe by uh, someone from Northern Ireland. And it was called The Hundred Great Texts. It was a book designed for preachers. These are the hundred texts that you must preach on before you die. It's a fascinating book. And some of the texts were obvious and you would have chosen them, and I would have chosen them, and a couple of them were, were not um, in my hundred great text wheelhouse, but this one was, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. You notice that it begins with the word, therefore. And whenever you see the word, therefore, you ask the question, what is the therefore there for. 
Why is it there? Because it's not a standalone text. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 is a text that speaks of consequences and obligations that every Christian has as a result of what we read of in verses 5 through 11. Verses 5 through 11 uh, is a passage that rises to the very peak. The Bible, you can think of the Bible like a range of mountains, and there are parts of the Bible that I would equate with Arizona. Or Iowa. When you drive and drive and drive and all you see is cornfields. And then you come to Denver, where my son lives. And a range of mountains as far as the eye can see. Philippians 2, 5 through 11 is like a Swiss mountain capped with snow and ice, reaching into the very skies. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, morphe theo, he was in the form of God, and did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, you can take that in two ways. He, he didn't have to reach out and grasp hold of the form of God because it was already his. I don't think that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, I think, the opposite. That though he was in the form of God, he didn't hold on to it in a manner that would refuse the incarnation and the lowliness of the incarnation but emptied himself. The ESV, which I'm reading, uh, dithered about this word, echinosin, and how to translate it. And the ESV was born out of a difference of opinion with the NIV over how you should translate the Greek into English. And the ESV balked for a season and translated this verb, echinosin, as a euphemism. He made himself nothing. But that's not the word that Paul uses. Paul uses a word, that a verb that you would use if you were emptying a pail of water onto the ground. He emptied himself. Now, if you ask yourself, of what did he empty himself? Or if you have bad English grammar, what did he empty himself of? If you answer that question, you're in the realm of heresy. Paul goes to the very edge, the very precipice. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. He emptied himself not by subtraction, but by addition. In addition to the form of God, he took the morphe dulu, the form of a servant. If you were to ask me, did Jesus have a life verse. Many of us have life verses. Typically, they're the verse that we first heard the gospel. I came, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. We don't have time here tonight to 
unpack that verse. That's not my text. But it's a verse that alludes to Isaiah 53. It's a verse that alludes to Daniel chapter 7. And it's a verse that alludes to the Passover ritual in Exodus. And these are passages where Jesus would have read as a young boy and as a teenager, and he would have said to himself, these passages are speaking about me, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to take the form of a servant and to give his life a ransom for many. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, Hooper, highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the name. That he is kurios. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the divine name, Yahweh, given in the first opening chapters of Exodus, that divine name was translated Kurios. Paul rightly understands what he is saying here, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's that's the theology. I believe Ephesians 2, 5 through 11 existed as a catechetical hymn in that 15, 20 years or so before the Gospels and before Paul's letters were available to the church. It's a hymn about the person and work of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? When John Owen, the great Puritan, went to his first charge in Cogshall, the first thing that he did was to write a catechism about the person of Christ and a catechism about the work of Christ. He was sending a signal that there is nothing more important in all the world than to understand who Christ is and to understand what Christ has done and achieved for us. This is Paul's great narrative of the incarnation, of the death and exaltation of Christ. Therefore, my beloved, on, on the basis of of what Jesus has done for you, you now have an obligation. If you believe what Paul is saying in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, there are massive obligations that fall upon you as believers, as Christians. Now, let me get to the text. The text is saying two things. One, you are to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, and the other is that God is going to work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. There. I can leave now. Well, let's examine it. Let's unpack it a little. You are to work out your own salvation. This is the obligation that lies upon you for 2024. This is Paul's charge to you. It's an imperative. Work out your own salvation. The verb is ergon. It occurs 20 times or so in the New Testament. We still have a word in the English language, ergonomics, which is the study of efficiency in work. Efficiency. 
It is something that we must do. It is something that lays a burden, an imperative upon us as believers. The New Testament is full of imperatives, things that we are to do and things that we are not to do. Now, some people will throw their hands up in the air and say, well, isn't that a form of legalism? Isn't the gospel uh, nothing in my hands I bring simply to thy cross I cling? Naked, look to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Ah, but Paul isn't talking here about justification. He's not answering the question, how can a person be made right with God? He answers that elsewhere. No, he's talking about the obligation that falls on the shoulders of everyone who is justified, of everyone who believes and trusts in the gospel, who has come with empty hands. Now, Paul says, and he calls them my beloved. It took a long time for me as a pastor to understand that it's always better to call even those whom you might regard as idiots. And there are a few in the church. But it's best to call them my beloved. As you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Paul is in prison, as uh, Dr. Lawson was preaching this morning, a very fine, fine, fine sermon on Colossians. And if you weren't here, you need to, you need to go and listen to it. Philippians and Colossians were probably written at the same time. When Paul was in prison, this is the imprisonment that we read of in the closing chapters of Acts. Technically, he was under house arrest, but there were soldiers and there were chains. And one imagines if Paul was to be able to move around in, in a house arrest situation, that there must have been some kind of bar, metal bar, and, and his, his, his chains would have been would have been fixed to that bar, but enabling him to move around. I'm conjecturing. Isn't it interesting that Paul is saying something to the Philippians when they can't see him? It's one thing to behave in a certain way when the preacher's around. It's another thing when the preacher isn't there. Well, this is no ordinary preacher. This is the Apostle Paul. One of the most useful servants that God ever gave to the church. He's in prison. He's waiting for a trial, a trial that never took place. The Jews never came. And he was released. And then sometime later, he was uh, arrested and, and killed Roughly, but not, not at the same time, but not, not far away from the killing of Peter. And because Paul was a Roman citizen, he was, um, his head was cut off. Peter was crucified upside down at his own request. But we think of Philippians as the epistle of joy. After all, the word joy occurs five times, I think, and the word rejoice, maybe nine or ten times, in an epistle of four chapters. And it contains that text, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And he's in prison. And as far as Paul knew at this time, he may be tried by Caesar and found guilty and be put to death. 
He didn't know that he was going to be released. This is one of the most astounding passages in Scripture that underlines Christian behavior and responsibility. That we have now as believers an obligation, an obligation to behave in a certain way. I sometimes put it this way, that the entry fee is nothing at all, but the annual dues is everything that you've got. Paul is calling for Christian effort. That the life of a Christian is not of being carried into heaven on a bed of roses. There was a movement in the early 20th century, and it's been around on other occasions in church history, and it was called quietism. Let go and let God. I'm a believer, I'm assured of heaven, there's nothing that I can do to add to my salvation, so I can sit back and be quiet and sing kumbaya and all will be well. That's not how Paul envisages the Christian life. The Christian life is one of battle. You take Ephesians 6 to put on the whole armor of God because we have an enemy, an enemy who is hell-bound to bring us to where he is, to rob us of our salvation. You are to know the wiles of the devil so that you are prepared when the day of trial comes. Paul speaks in Ephesians 6 of the battle, the Christian life equipped with all the necessary parts of soldiery so that you so that in the evil day you might be able to stand. And I think what he means by evil day is that there are seasons. I've known seasons when I could have reached out and touched him. There was a sense of evil. I sensed it. It was an evil day. Paul is calling here for spirit-filled, gospel-driven, Christ-exalting effort. Work out your own salvation. You see, God never treats us as robots. We're not automatons. We have a will, a renewed will. A will that is able to sin and a will that is not able to sin. And they are constantly in battle, they are constantly in tension. The good that I would, I do not, and the evil that I would not, that I find I do. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death. And I believe that Paul is talking there about Christians now. There's some disagreement, but I believe that Paul is talking there about about Christians. It's certainly an experience that you and I experience as, as believers. 
that the very thing that you would not do, you do. And the very thing that you would not do, you do. What does he mean by work out your salvation? Well, you employ the means of grace. You come to church and fellowship with the community of like-minded believers. You worship on the Lord's day, sing his praises and read his word and listen to that word expounded and explained to you. You go to a Sunday school class with more Bible study because you can never get enough of Bible study. And you pray morning, noon, and night. Pray without ceasing. You mortify the deeds of the flesh because Paul says elsewhere, that if we, if we don't mortify the deeds of the flesh, we shall perish. You engage in killing sin. John Owen famously said in volume six of his works that I first read now almost 50 years ago, kill a sin or a part of a sin every day. What sin have you locked onto today? And ask God for help to put this sin to death. I had a tree once in my backyard. It was in Belfast in Northern Ireland. And this tree was growing and growing, and if I allowed it to grow any further, the roots were going to damage the property and the garage especially. So I hired a chainsaw. It's the one and only time I have hired a chainsaw. I made a promise to my wife that I would never, ever hire a chainsaw again. But it felt powerful. For a moment, I was someone else. And for a moment, I felt as though I had a belt around me with all kinds of, of, of equipment and tools. All the tools I possess could fit in a bag this size. It's in the closet. That's all I have. I cut this tree down, but I, I didn't do anything with the stump of it and the roots of it. I, I just let it. A year later, it's growing again. And some sins are like that. If you don't deal with the root cause of them. You must kill sin. You must also engage in what the reformers called vivification, to bring to life the fruits of the Spirit. And notice Paul says, with fear and trembling. Fear, I think, in the sense of awe, but fear also in the sense of seriousness. We're not playing at being Christians, this is a serious matter. And trembling, it's the word that's used in Mark 16 of the two Marys and Salome when they come to the tomb and they see a man dressed in white who says to them that Jesus is not here, but he is risen. And they, they fled, Mark says, for trembling and astonishment had seized them for they were Afraid. They had been in the presence of the supernatural. 
this man in white, an angel. Maybe it was Gabriel, I don't, I don't know. But they were in the presence of something, someone who had perforated through space and time from heaven to this world. And they trembled. Should we ever be afraid? You remember what, what the author of Hebrews says in chapter 12 and verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That should make you tremble. That should make you serious. That if there's no tangible, measurable holiness, you have no basis of assurance that you will see the Lord in his graciousness and kindness and love. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What are you going to do this year to improve your baptism? I need to be careful here. The Westminster Divines in the larger catechism talk about improving your baptism. And it works just as well for believers' baptism. Baptism is just the start. It's just the inauguration. But there's a life ahead of ministry and service and commitment. What area of your life needs to grow? Get a piece of paper. Oh, some of you were given those fancy little notebooks with, with, with pieces of elastic that come around the front and fancy pens for Christmas. And you think to yourself, you said thank you and thought to yourself, what am I going to do with this? Let me suggest that in the coming week you write down four or five sins that you want to work on for this coming year. And four or five graces. Go to Galatians 5 and write down the fruit of the Spirit. And how well are you doing, by the way? But then, I need to move on, otherwise my sermon's going to be as long as Steve Lawson's this morning. <laughs> and and I, I promised Andrew that I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. There's a second part to this text. And it's such a comforting part. All that effort, all that stress and strain, and it could almost drive you to despair if you didn't have the second part. That God is at work in you. It is God who works in you. He wants to bring you all the way home. Now, Paul isn't saying that he worked in you once at justification, but the rest of it is all up to you. No, that's not what he's saying. Nor is he saying that you do 50% and God does 50%. No, you both do 100%. But... We are comparing apples and oranges here. What is your puny 100% like? In comparison to the sovereign, almighty, infinite, omnipotent God who created the heavens and the earth. What is your working in comparison to God's working? Omnipotence is at work in you. That omnipotence that changed your will, that omnipotence that gave you a new heart, that omnipotence that renewed you and justified you and adopted you, and that omnipotence will be at work in sanctifying you. <laughs> 
It's impossible to understand. How do we, how do we f- explain these two things? That there is an obligation that we have that cannot be lessened. Paul is asking for 100% commitment to follow Jesus all the way home. And at the same time, God is at work. In a way that is compatible, there is human responsibility and therefore accountability and the sovereignty of God. Look at the words here. To will and to work for his good pleasure. You remember in Ephesians chapter 1 when Paul is talking about election and predestination, and these are the words that he uses. These are predestination words. These are words of God's sovereignty, God's will, his inviolable will, the will of his purpose, the will of his intent that cannot be broken. I use the illustration of a railway track, two lines that run parallel and they, 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 they don't deviate and nor do they cross. I don't think that helps at all, but I use that illustration. In justification, there is the work of divine monogism. We are dead in trespasses and in sins. We We contribute nothing. But in sanctification, in progressive sanctification, there is what we call synergism. We cooperate with God. It is a mystery. We have to live with mystery. Poor Job had to live with mystery. God didn't answer a single one of his questions, but asked 70 more that Job couldn't answer. Now, there are some Calvinists who emphasize the sovereignty of God at the expense of human responsibility. You remember William Carey. I can can mention William Carey here as a Baptist, a young man wanting to go as a missionary to India. And Baptist leaders saying to him, sit down, young man, if God is pleased to convert the heathen, he'll do it without your help or ours. That's a complete misunderstanding of Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Work out your salvation, but... There'll be times when you fail, you realize your weakness, and you remember that God is working in you, that the Holy Spirit has filled you and equipped you and helped you to strengthen you, to stand beside you in the battle and to bring you all the way home. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this word, this text. It brings before us a solemn duty, but it also brings to us a wonderful, reassuring promise that you are with us, working in us and through us to achieve the fulfillment of your immeasurable will and purpose. So grant your blessing on believers in this congregation in 2024, and that this city will see this place as a place that shines holiness, and commitment to Christ in a way that makes this church so different from the rest of the world, like a shining light, like a city that is set upon a hill that cannot be hid. Hear us, Lord, for Jesus' sake.